Welcome to Grace Life Church. I'm David Kinneberg, one of the teaching elders here at Grace Life. We want to thank you for joining us online and listening to our sermons online. Hope they are a blessing and encouragement to you. If you want more information, you can check out our website at glcanoka.org. Thanks and God bless. Good morning. I take this off, take the skinny mic off. Getting here is an adventure now. If you take any alternate way, you'll end up, uh, I was telling Dan, you almost have to go to Elk River to come here now if you're coming from any other direction, but did make it here. Now, I want to imagine. I want you to imagine something. You're going to. There's going to be a. Maybe it's your birthday party or some other celebration, and everybody's going to celebrate you. And come, come in, and we'll make it Dan's birthday. Dan's having a birthday. Yay for Dan! And Dan shows up, and you know there's. Some streamers, but the streamers, you can tell, they were like left over. Maybe somebody dug them out of the garbage or something. And there's a sort of a, a buffet of things, and it's fruit that you can tell came from the ugly fruit section at hy V. And there's some cheese, but it's kind of moldy and dried out and cracked. You know, the, the crackers are kind of stale tasting. The Doritos, of all things, are just little, tiny little pieces. It's like the, you know, somebody had one of those ginormous bags and the very last bottom crumbs were what was dumped out and put into the tray. And the presents looked like they were wrapped, generously saying this, by a two-year-old. And the stuff that's in it is like uh, somebody grabbed some socks out of their sock drawer, and they weren't the best socks. They were the ones that sort of had a hole getting ready to appear in the heel. Now, would Dan feel honored or insulted? When it comes to the way we approach different things in life, our worship to the Lord is the most important aspect it has an impact on everything we say, do, and think. It is the motivation that guides our life. Frankly, from a counseling perspective, uh, one of the things that you can do is you can go, go around if you're dealing with somebody that's struggling in life and you know nail problems, fix this problem, fix that problem, fix that problem. And... If that's the, pers- that's the approach that you take to dealing with life problems, you're like the, the little Dutch boy sticking your finger in the hole in the dam, except for there's keeps popping out to be more holes. Ultimately, what we need to do is get our worship right. Now, I'm not talking about coming here and worship. That's great. Corporate worship is sort of the training ground for day-to-day worship. That's what we're doing here. But if our worship is right, so much else of what our life falls into place. That's really what we're going to start off with this morning in Proverbs chapter 3. Let's go to Lord and word of prayer, and then we'll look at Proverbs chapter 3 and begin with verse 9. Dear Heavenly Father, as we come before you, I thank you that you are a God that is worthy of worship and praise. You strung out the the skies like like a a giant necklace, and uh, it's beautiful and beyond our comprehension. And the more we're able to see, the more we discover how vast and amazing your creation is. As we come before you, I just ask that we would give to you the worship that you are due. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Now, if you remember from last week, one of the verses we looked at, and it's really the key verse of Proverbs chapter 3, is trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. Oftentimes when we run into commands of the scripture, we go, what does that look like? How is that going to be realized? Well, the remainder of chapter 3 begins fleshing that out. Let's look at verses 9 and 10. I'm just going to read verse 9 here to begin with, and then we'll look at verse 10. It says here, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Now, the, the situation here is, and oftentimes when we come to a verse like this, there's the, the first churches that Muffy and I went to after graduating from college, you, you could expect hearing a verse like this almost every other Sunday. And the motivation behind that was a reverse motivation of really what the Word of God is intending. In fact, oftentimes you can turn on the television and you will hear, hear this verse. And we'll have some explanation and set this in context. But there's this idea, and again, uh, I've sat under and I've heard preachers and teachers really with the idea of, okay, we need to get more money into the church. That is not the motivation here, and that should not be the motivation of studying and looking at this verse. It's how do we view what we have? If I'm going to trust in the Lord, how am I going to deal with my material blessings? Verse 9 starts off, honor the Lord with your wealth. And it's really talking about what you treasure. What are some of the things that you enjoy? Think about the things you enjoy. Then think about the things that you spend your money on. You know, what you spend your money on is a very good indication of where your priorities in life are. The Bible says, honor the Lord with your wealth. It should be, hey, this is what I value the Lord as. I want to share a little story, and I don't want to go too far afield on this, but there's a young Christian man when Mafia and I were in New Jersey. Uh, he, he actually came to confront me when we, we were living in the parsonage about some of my grievous errors. And uh, he sat down and he says, okay, I, I want to talk to you about, you know, my wife and I are really concerned. Uh, we haven't heard you preach about X. I go, well, okay, we, we preached about that on Wednesday nights. Well, they weren't there Wednesday nights. He said, well, okay, then you haven't preached about why. And I said, okay, that was, we've been having an adult Sunday school time, and that's the subject we've been going over. So he brought up several different things, and each thing he brought up is like, yeah, we're, we're dealing with that. One of the last things he brought up with is, hey, you're not talking about giving enough in the church. And, you know, why, why aren't you talking about tithing? Now, let me say something here, and it's very important. That a lot of times, in fact, the context of the verse that we're going to look at is very important as well. Tithing is something that is set up as a requirement under the Old Testament law. It was a part of the covenant between Israel and the Lord. In fact, we'll even see part of that in verse verse 9 here. Well, in fact, the second part of verse 9 says, with the first fruits of all your produce. You know, if you were raising a little vegetable garden and you had 10 tomatoes, that very first nice, beautiful, right, tomato, that was the Lord's. You honored the Lord with that first. And he said, why don't you preach on tithing? I said, well, because tithing is not the New Testament form of giving. New Testament form of giving is to give as the Lord has prospered you. Now, when I said that, I do have to commend him because when he heard that, he just sat there and he thought. He says, I don't have that much money. See, the point that he realized was if it's, has the Lord prospered you, it's not going to be, okay, how you know, how little can I give? 
That's exactly what happened with the, the scribes and the Pharisees. You know, they, they would tithe. They'd have their little mint garden in their window, and they would cut off a little sprig of the mint, and that would go to the Lord. And they would take that to the, you know, the, the temple, and they would tithe of the smallest little things. But that was because that was their maximum. They looked at the tenth as the maximum. Where here it says, honor the Lord with your wealth. It's, it's really about our heart attitude. You know, it's an expression of our love for the Lord. You know, if, again, going back to the illustration of Dan, if we had a party like that for Dan, and everything was really junky and garbage and yuck, Dan would have the right to feel insulted. In fact, instead of saying, oh, well, at least they remembered my birthday, we'd probably be celebrating it on the wrong day if we were doing all the other. At least they remembered me. No, it'd be, wow, this is insulting. I'd rather them not having done anything. So ultimately, the issue of our wealth and the way that we give is a hard attitude. Why do we give? When we serve the Lord, it should be out of love, honor, and respect for who he is. It says here, and with the first fruits of all your produce, there's two aspects to this idea, idea of first fruits. It's, it's from the beginning. It's not, okay, let's see what I have left over, and then I, I'm going to honor the Lord. So it, it's not the remainder. It's not the last that we have. Let me go to the Old Testament and let us think about a, a story in the Old Testament. I, I want you to put this possibly in a different context. The Bible doesn't spell this out, so it could be one of two situations here. When Cain and Abel were making sacrifice, the Lord was pleased with Abel's sacrifice, but displeased with Cain's sacrifice. Now, from some context clues, we might deduce that, well, it's because Cain gave of the fruit of the ground and Abel gave a blood sacrifice. I don't think that was actually the situation. If you think that's the case, I could understand that. But I think it was more about a heart situation. In the Old Testament, there were things such as the wave offering and free will offerings that were given to the Lord that, were, that had nothing to do with blood sacrifices. Uh, and those sacrifices would be of the fruit of the ground. I think the situation with Cain and Abel was this. You know, Abel went out to his uh, flock and he found the very best lamb that he had. And he took and sacrificed that to the Lord. When it came Abel's turn, he's thinking, okay, I'm going to give a sacrifice. He opened up the refrigerator and oh, he dug back in there and he found the zucchini that had a hole starting to rot into it. Like, okay, that's perfect. I'm not going to eat that. He found out the, found the orange that was starting to get a hole hard and crusty. He's like, okay, that's past. He went and found it, all the stuff that had the expiration date way past. By the way, uh, I'll tell a little bit on Muffy. When, when we go through the, the refrigerator, Muffy sees the sell-by date, and that's the, it's going to explode and no longer be good date. <laughs> Don't eat that now. <laughs> But that's exactly what Cain did, was he found probably stuff that had fallen from the trees and the stuff that had gotten bent over and dirty and was gross, and he gave that to the Lord. I wasn't going to eat it anyway. I don't know if you've ever heard of a mission barrel. At college, we had mission barrels, and you could donate articles of clothing to it. Some of the stuff that went into the mission barrel <laughs> should have went into the garbage. And sometimes we have mission barrel giving when it comes to our life to the Lord. It's what I have left over. The Bible says here, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. It's not a, a, a matter of amount. It's not a matter of, you know, the Lord needs it. 
How much money does the Lord need? Zero. What he needs is our heart. And where we spend our resources and our time indicates where our heart is. Verse 10, there's a promise that goes along with this. And I want to give you an important context about this promise. Because this was the command given under the Old Testament. It says, then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. Okay, we have to be careful here that the reason why we give to the Lord is to get. I know there's people that have went through suffering and trials and they, they turn in bitterness to the Lord and they go, hey, I, I've given time, I've given money and I'm going through this trouble and difficulty. Uh, what's in this? It shouldn't be this way. If I give things, everything should be perfect. Now, under the Old Testament covenant, the covenant between Israel and God, if you followed the covenant, there were blessings, and if you didn't follow it, there were curses. And it was a guarantee that, yes, if you followed the covenant, God was going to bountifully bless you with material things. So this is an Old Testament promise for people under the Old Testament covenant. Now you might say, well, that sounds so much better than this. Because frankly, if we were under the Old Testament covenant, you could listen to some of these people that take the Bible out of context. That, hey, you, you give $5 to the Lord, he's going to give you 50 back. You could go under the Old Testament covenant. I, I'm just going to follow this to a T, and I'm going to do so well financially. I, I'm just I'm going to set myself up. By the way, there is a value in that under the Old Testament. That was an expression of faith. You know, if you knew that uh, if you could travel back in time and buy uh, Apple stock at a dollar per stock, would you do it? Yeah, a guaranteed blessing. They had a guaranteed blessing under the Old Testament covenant, yet oftentimes they did not take advantage of it. Under the New Testament, sometimes we will, we will do all the things such as honoring the Lord with our wealth and we can serve him with time. And as believers, oftentimes we face persecution for it instead of reward. Unless you're in a predominantly Christian country, it's almost a guarantee that if you're giving your life to the Lord, you're going to face struggle and persecution. You may dra dramatically reduce your standard of living by the naming the name of Christ. That doesn't sound like a fulfillment of this promise. No, it's because we have a higher promise. See, we might think, man, it would be so nice to be under that Old Testament blessing and I could give and re re uh, retrieve material blessings for myself. But the fact is, our blessings are especially superior. You know, the Old Testament was a shadow of the spiritual blessings that we receive. When they sacrifice their blood sacrifices, they're looking forward to the ultimate sacrifice of Christ. Our offerings are not of material things, but of spiritual things, and God blesses us spiritually and eternally, which is way better. What is our worship light? Now, I want to look at just two more verses. I was going to look under a whole, I was going to go actually down to verse 26. But I'm only going to look at two more verses this morning. But verse 11 says, My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof. Now, in the situation Proverbs, it might almost seem like, okay, here's another situation Proverbs. We talk about one thing and we jump onto another topic. This right here is under the context of that verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. And he says here, again, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof. 
For the Lord repro reproves him whom he loves as a father the son in whom he delights. This is repeated in the New Testament as well. And we're reminded to actually look at the Lord's discipline in our life as something that is great and wonderful. Now, if Muffy and I go down to the Mall of America, now all of our, our sons are grown up, but if we went down there when our, our children were young and we went to, uh, what is it? Is it still Camp? It's not Camp Snoopy anymore, is it? Whatever, it's uh, Mall of America Amusement Park, whatever. And, and our kids start running and pushing past people. We're going to correct them. They're our children. We love them. We want the best for them. Our job is not to correct the hundreds of other kids that are uh, behaving or misbehaving there. We, be, we correct our children because we love them. And that's one of the indications when we go through difficult times and we know it's connected to not conforming to God's word. He does that because he loves us. Now, it's interesting. There's oftentimes we think of discipline in the starkest and hardest terminologies or the worst case scenarios. Now, when, when my children were younger, the best way to correct them, if you saw them heading for the wrong direction, was to be able to speak to them. Hey, don't do that. And frankly, that was one of the best things for them to do, is hear that and change direction. Ultimately, what the message in verses 11 and 12 is is exactly what you guys are doing here this morning. All of us, when we gather together, you know what we're doing? We're listening to the reproof of the Lord. Now, not all the time. Sometimes when we look at a passage, it doesn't speak directly to an area of deficiency in our life that needs to be corrected. But reproof is one of the hallmarks of God's word. Have you ever sat down in a sermon and suddenly, man, I'll, I'll share this story. My dad got saved when he was 30. Before he was 30, he, he had figured out how to be a very efficient and prolific sinner. He did very well at it. And my, my mom, when they moved from California up to this little spot in Montana, they'd opened a church my mom started attending the church. Eventually, she, she encouraged my father to attend. He got very mad. Because every single time he went and heard one of the sermons, he thought my mom had been going to the preacher and talking about their life and what was going on. <laughs> You, you can't be telling the, all of our family secrets to the preacher. You know what? That's one of the wonderful things about God's word is it does speak to our heart and it does reprove us. It does say, hey, this isn't what it should be. Sometimes we may not even be looking in the word about something where we need to be convicted, but as we're hearing God's word, the Holy Spirit uses that to even convict us of other things elsewhere in our life. That's why sometimes, you know, you know every time you sit down, it's like, oh, it sounds like that passage was written just to me because the Holy Spirit is using it in our life. So we should never despise the Lord's correction and reproof. So this is the greatest way of experiencing God's reproof, is hearing God's word spoken and go, oh, I need to change direction here. Here's something I need to change about my life. One of the reasons we, we do it every Sunday is because even though we've heard all this, uh, raise, raise your hands if you heard something brand new that you've never heard before in the last several years of sermons. Okay. 
maybe unique presentations, but I'll bet you you've heard basically those ideas before. You know, after a while, shouldn't we be able to go, okay, we've had enough preaching. We'll just save that for the people that have only had a few sermons. No, we need it constantly. We need to hear that reproof and that direction and change in our life from God's word. And that's what it means, my son, do not despise the Lord's discipline. What we're doing by going into God's word is we're receiving God's discipline. And it's not a negative thing, it's a positive thing. It's an expression of his love for us. You know, when you have young kids and you're next to a body of water, you keep a really close eye on them because you don't want them falling in and being swept away. God wants to keep a close eye on us. He wants to reprove us. Nope, you're getting too close. Come back. As the Lord reproves him whom he loves as a father's son in whom he delights. Now, there's two things with that. One, it's better to hear than to feel. If we don't hear, oftentimes we have to feel because God loves us and he will bring things in our life that draws us back to him and where we should be. And it's expression of his love. So there's two things that we, we looked at this morning. We're not going to look at the full sermon that I was going to look at. But two things, honoring the Lord. What is our worship like? My heart is what determines my direction. When I was teaching different individuals how to play basketball, I've coached a lot of basketball. One of the things I teach them is you shoot with your eyes. If you're not looking on the right thing, you're going to miss. You, you'll hit the wrong spot. If you're looking on the wrong part on the backboard, you're going to, you're going to hit the wrong spot. Where's our eyes? Where's our heart? Our heart is like our eyes. It leads us in the direction we should be. Are we honoring the Lord? What is our worship like? And what is our desire for hearing God's reproof? That's something that we should be ready for and desirous of. That if there's some spot in our life that is not conforming and honoring the Lord, that we would hear it and be reproved. That's God's expression of love for us. Let's go and close in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, as come before you. I thank you for your word. I thank you that we do not always have to feel. That's the least best option is to have to go through suffering to be corrected. But Lord, we can turn to you and we can change direction based on hearing your word. Lord, I ask with our heart that that would be the direction of our life, that our, our number one aspiration of life is to honor you. Not just with our material things, but with our time, our energy, our thoughts. Lord, work your way in us. In Jesus' name, amen.